And we start now with what I call a gentle introduction to cryptography. And uh, for you cryptographers, this would be, of course, known material. And for even known cryptographers, some of this uh, might be known. But it's something that I want to put forward so that we whole, we all understand the same set of concepts and we can you know, use it as a basis uh, for further analysis. So without any further ado, crypto, as we know, is something that provides for us fundamentally the building blocks to achieve security, communication security. You can have you know, various property of the communication. You can have privacy, confidentiality, so you want to make sure that nobody can access the information unless they are the person intended for it. You can have authentication, which means that you uh, want to make sure that the person sending you a message is actually the person that claims to be uh, the sender of the message. Uh, you want integrity so that no modification to the messages can be performed without being detected. And in certain cases, you want non-repudiation. So you want to be able to go to a third party and say, hey, you know, this person has sent me a message and therefore, for example, this is a contract that must be you know, considered valid or similar situation. So in its simplest possible form, you have the process of encryption is super simple. You have a clear text that goes through an encryption process that is parametrized by a key that becomes ciphertext and then by using the same key or a different key, you have a decryption process that gives you back the clear text. And this has been going on for thousands of years. You know, the Caesar ciphertext, you know, was using by, um, by the Romans and, you know, with le different levels of sophistication. Uh, better algorithms came out in the 1500s, then in the 1700s, and then, you know, it, it evolved to what we have today. And of course, Cryptography has its dual, which is cryptanalysis. That is, you know, the, uh, the attempt to break encryption. Uh, fundamentally, cryptanalysis can happen in different ways. You can have the, let's say, the more difficult and more powerful attack, which is a ciphertext only. That is, you have just samples of stuff that has been encrypted, and you have either to extract a key or extract a message. Okay. Uh, for example, if you look at the history with the Enigma encryption machine during World War II, what the, um, what the, in a way, what the um, initially what they had was a pure ciphertext only attack. They could only see the encryption communication between the um, the sort of the commands of the uh, of the Nazi. Um, of the Nazi army, but uh, little by little they switched to something else. They find out that certain patterns were predictable. So uh, they moved to sort of a known plain text attack where you know that certain text has been encrypted and so even though you don't know the key, you can use this information to break. So in a known plain text attack, if you have, uh, you know, you have um, a known text and uh, something that has been encrypted, a known text and that text been encrypted and so forth, giving these many samples, the goal of the decryption process is to either obtain the key or being able from that point on to decrypt additional messages, okay? And then you have the third and most powerful attack in a way uh, where the plain text is actually chosen. So you have your algorithm is fundamentally an oracle, and you can say, oh, please encrypt this. And something encrypted comes back. Hmm, interesting. Now encrypt this, and something comes back. Now encrypt this. And so you can actually, uh, you don't have, the, the samples are chosen by you. You're not you know, given a bunch of uh, plain text with their encrypted version, but you actually actively probe the encryption system in a way in order to find particular weaknesses. For example, you can start with, you know, oh, let's see what happens when we encrypt all zeros. Let's see what, what happens when I only change one bit. How is the encryption changing? And so you, you can actually, if you have a chosen plain text attack, you can set up a bunch of hypotheses and explore them during the cryptanalysis process. 
But of course, this is, you know, this is a, a very, very high level view of the problem. There are many ways to do cryptanalysis that are not described here. So um, let's talk about the security of a crypto system. There is only one provable security, pr provably secure uh, crypto system called a one time pad. And fundamentally is taking a message, generated, uh, generating a complete random uh, string of bits, XORing the message with this uh, string of bits and sending the encrypted message. And the key is this randomly generated uh, string of bits and uh, of bits. And obviously, uh, one of the problems is that you have to share that key, and we will see how that um, is a problem. But this is, you know, proven to be absolutely secure. Unless you are able to know the random set of bits, you will not be able to uh, recover the plain text. But Nowadays, we don't use the one-time pad most of the time, and we use instead algorithms that are called computational, computationally secure. That means fundamentally that they make the, uh, the decryption process, or actually the, the, the breaking the encryption process, so difficult that it's not worthwhile. So for example, if the cost of breaking something, because you have, for example, to uh, go on Amazon and get all the Amazon cloud to try all the possible keys, then of course, you know, probably uh, this is reasonable only if the information that you're trying to extract has that value. If I want his password and I have to spend billions of dollars in order to obtain it, I would just, you know, use other means. And also there is a time problem. If it takes, you know, a million year to try all the possible combination with the fastest possible machine on earth, well, yeah, I mean, you're computationally secure. That what it, that's what it means. Uh, of course, the cost and time are difficult to estimate because technology changes. Uh, once, you know, in the 70s, uh, thinking about brute forcing uh, a 56 key for DES was not really feasible. Right now, you know, you could probably do it with off-the-shelf components and, you know, get away with it. So as technology evolves and can do more faster with more memory, uh, of course, the definition of computationally secure changes. Also, you could have new algorithms that are able to change the way in which we actually break stuff. And so all this is in continuous change. And that's why we have a continuous new set of algorithms appearing um, and being proposed by the crypto community. And of course, we have the exhausted key space search. So the fact that not only you use attacks like cryptanalysis, but you simply try all possible combination of a key, which is you know, easy to compute because you take the bits of a key, you do two to the number of bits, and you know how many variation of that particular key you can have. And of course, this is all valid if there are no backdoors. That's why this idea of certification and bringing certain algorithms to the community has always received a lot of scrutiny because you know, if there is one particular group that says, oh, we should all use this algorithm, you know, it's secure, trust me. Uh, this needs to be validated by a group of peers so that it is actually a collective agreement that those algorithms are secure. And that's a process that we use nowadays to um, accept those, those algorithms. And if these algorithms don't, uh, don't pass the peer uh, evaluation, because for example, there is a doubt that it could be a backdoor somewhere, then they're not usually adopted by the international community. And of course, you know, there is security crypto system in the real world. Uh, uh, this is uh, a great SKCD uh, um, cartoon where you can actually break the encryption, you know, by just taking people and beating them up with a hammer. But, you know, we're not going to talk about that. So crypto algorithms, as you probably know, they're you know, two main kinds of crypto algorithms. They're symmetric algorithms, also called conventional single key, secret key. And in this case, the encryption and decryption key is exactly the same. And then we have public key algorithms called asymmetric, where there are two different keys for encryption and decryption. 
or two different keys with the idea that uh, you cannot, given a key, find the other key. So uh, resolving a key from an existing key is uh, not possible. And whatever is encrypted with one key can only be decrypted with the other key. And this was, uh, as we will see, a fundamental change in the way we do cryptography. Uh, public key cryptography uh, came in the mid-70s, 1970s, and before then, the only thing that really existed was secret key cryptography. So imagine for you know, 4,000 years, you have you know, one type of cryptography, and suddenly something completely new that changed the way in which we look at crypto came up. And that's not surprising that now you know, the authors of these kind of algorithms are Turing Awards and have been celebrated uh, by the computer science community. There are also uh, other algorithms that are not directly you know, encrypting algorithms, but they're very important for security. One uh, important class of algorithms are one-way hash functions. And the basic idea of one-way hash function is that they take fundamentally any amount of data and they produce a fixed representation that is usually very limited. So they can take any amount of data and will give you 160 bits, for example. And the basic idea is that even though you can come up with a one-way hash function now, you can say, oh, I'm going to take the first 160 bits. That would be a one-way hash function that take takes any kind of data and gives you 160 bits. But you want specific properties for this function. In particular, you want to make it unfeasible to change the message without changing the hash. So of course, if you take the first 160 bit of the data, you can change anything after the first 160 bit and the hash will be the same. So that would not be a good hash. Or it would be unfeasible to pre-compute the hash all the hash space. So you cannot be able to uh, sort of already have something that would generate every possible hash in the destination space. It is unfeasible to find a message that, gen that will generate or will end up as a result, uh, uh, generate a specific given hash. So if you tell me, okay, these are the 160 bit. Give me a document that will generate this 160 bit hash. If we take the first 160 bit, it's very easy. I do something that starts with that and then as whatever. So that would not be a good hash. And it's unfeasible or incredibly hard to find two, message, two messages that generate the same hash. That, there is, that means that there is a hash collision. Okay? Those are properties that we need for that type of function. And of course, you can parameterize the transformation using keys and all sorts of different uh, properties. And then you have random number generators that can be real random number generators. For, for example, they use a physical phenomenon like you know, noise in some you know, um, resistance, some electrical uh, microscopic phenomenon, or could be pseudo-random number generators that actually take a seed, and then they use an algorithm to generate a sequence of numbers that appears uh, to be random enough. Okay, and there, these are you know there are entire classes of researchers, groups of researchers, just generating these algorithms and showing which one is best, which one is worse, and they have produced a number of example symmetric algorithms that you might know are DES, which is now considered broken. RC4, also considered broken. Uh, AES is the current uh, standard, fundamentally, for symmetric algorithms. And then we have public key algorithms like dv hellman RSA, elliptic curve-based algorithm. And as one-way hash function, we had MD5 for a long time, that now is considered broken um, in many possible uses. And uh, SHA-256, which is uh, what's you know, commonly used today. So these are just libraries. So once you know what is the role of these components, you say, oh, I need to, you know, a hash function. You get, you know, SHA-256, and you use it using a Python library. You don't re-implement your own crypto. And even worse, you don't produce your own new crypto. Most of the time, unless you're a cryptologist, then you, that's what you do. Okay, so we talked about communication and how um, 
cryptography gives uh, us the building blocks to build secure communication. And in usually, when we talk about communication, we have our scheme with Alice, Bob, and Eve, where Eve is the evil um, witch, which is trying to interfere the, um, the communication between Alice and Bob. And here, as we always do when we do a vulnerability analysis, we have to have a threat model. So our idea of what can uh, the bad guy do. In this case, uh, in our threat model, we know that Eve can intercept messages, so can block a message and prevent a message from going to, uh, from Alice to Bob, can repeat messages, so can record messages and send them again, can modify any messages, so you can actually stop, change something, and send it over, and can also, uh, but cannot break the cryptography. So we assume that the, in this particular threat model, the crypto works. So there is no way, uh, it's not a threat model in which cryptanalysis is actually a threat. They will not be able to break it, okay? And we want to provide all these different properties, confidentiality, authentication, integrity, and non-repudiation. So the easier way to communicate in this setting is using symmetric encryption. So fundamentally, I have to communicate to, say, Lucas. Uh, Lucas and I decide on, a, on an algorithm, in this case, AES, and we also decide on a secret key K, which is gonna be something very difficult to guess, like, you know, chow chow four. And, and then, once they decided on this, the, I decide to encrypt my message with a key, and he decrypts the message with the same key that we agree on. The, the advantages of this type of communication, of course, is confidentiality, super simple. There is a weak form of authentication, which is, you know, if I receive a message from Lucas encrypted with Chow Chow 4, since I only told that to Lucas, I can be pretty sure that it's Lucas that sent me, because unless he told to somebody, I know that uh, that's the only key that we share for that type of communication. And also we have some weak form of integrity, meaning that if somebody sends me random data and I try to decrypt it with Chow Chow 4, I will get some random data out. So unless the communication that we have between the two of us is chunks of random data, which very, very you know, seldom happens, usually some text or some structured data, uh, it, trying to send garbage or modifying the message will end up in gibberish that will sort of like identify the problem of integrity. Of course, there are a lot of cons. The key distribution is critical. How do I set up with uh, my partner in communication the key? Uh, we can, you know, meet in secret somewhere and decide the key, but then we have to be careful not to be overheard. Uh, it would become really cumbersome uh, because it requires out-of-band communication. That is not very useful, especially at a scale. For example, if you want to have something on the internet, you cannot really use this type of communication. Also, if the key is compromised, uh, the Eve can impersonate Alice with Bob and Bob with Alice, which is pretty catastrophic. And also, the number of keys increases with the number of people I have to talk to. So if I have to talk to him, to Lucas, to him, I need keys with all of them. And if they have to talk among themselves, then they need also keys among themselves, and this becomes very fast, unmanageable. And there is no known repudiation. So I can encrypt something with Chow Chow 4 and make it appear like Lucas sent it and say, well, you know, he's the only one who knows the password. And he will say, yeah, but Giovanni, you know the password too. Of course, you know, this, I cannot prove in front of a judge that Lucas you know, wrote this message. So it is useful, has been used for a long time, but it doesn't provide all the flexibility that we want. A way to get around some of the limitation is to use a key distribution center. So uh, the, key distribution, the key distribution center mechanism, Alice shares one key with the key distribution center. This key is set up with some out of band communication that happens between Alice and the key distribution center. Bob shares also a key with the key distribution center, 
and this is also set up by out-of-band communication. And when the two want to communicate, they tell it to the key distribution center, which generates a session key that is sent to the two parties encrypted with the key that they share with the key distribution center. And then the two parties use that temporary key to talk to each other in an encrypted way. And if you think about it, this is the scheme that is very similar, what's, uh, uh, very similar to what is used in the Kerberos system. Okay? So you have all these aspects of generating tickets, generating temporary session keys, so that everybody who participates to the same infrastructure and shares keys with the same key distribution center can talk to each other. And any idea why this might not work? You have to trust the key distribution center. What else? Say again. No, she can't because she cannot. If the the out of band communication between the users and the KDC has been established, so there is, they share a key, Eve cannot interfere with that communication, okay? That would work only if actual Eve would intercept that initial out of band communication between the KDC and the user. That is true, yes? For example, this is not scaling very well. It might work for a group of people, but if you want to communicate it across you know, the world, this might not scale. More important, uh, this is all correct. So the advantage is that you don't have as many keys because everybody needs one key with the key distribution center. And also, the session key that is generated is only temporary. So if it gets compromised, we throw it away, we time it out, and not as much damage can be done. The cons are the single point of failure. So if somebody breaks into the KDC, the game is over, which is not very nice. But also, we need constant availability of the KDC. So if somebody does a denial of service against the key distribution center, nobody can communicate anymore. And that requires you know, a very good infrastructure that is resilient to denial of service attacks. And therefore, you really uh, add complexity to the problem. But this is you know, one of the best ways to use. If you, if you need to use only uh, uh, symmetric encryption, that would be a good approach to using symmetric encryption. But fortunately, we have asymmetric encryption. And so this is what was the game changer in cryptography. Now, Alice and Bob have to agree on the public crypto system that they're going to use, for example, RSA. Bob sends his public key to Alice. Okay? Alice now, and the public key can be seen by anybody. It doesn't have to be out of band in the secret room saying chow chow four and the secret password that will be used between two people. This key can be sent on the internet for everybody to see. Actually, my public key is on my web page. Everybody can download it and see it. And now Alice encrypts a message with Bob public key. And now that message can only be decrypted by Bob. Because Bob is the only person who has both the public key and the secret key. And so unless you have the secret key, you have no way to access that message. So with this, you can see that you solve the key distribution problem. I can give my public key to everybody and never have to worry about anything, which is great. OK? Uh, there was a question? Yes? Well, this alone isn't enough, right? Because someone could modify the message and the key distribution. We will talk about that in a second. And there is confidentiality, because Eve needs Bob's secret key to decrypt the message. And there is no way Eve can access that key. And there is the weak concept of integrity that we, sh that we say if somebody modified the message, probably decryption by the secret key will result in you know, something that is, looks corrupted. Yes? So the private key is known to both Alice and Bob. 
No. So everybody has two key, a public key and a private key. I keep my private key private, hence the name, and I make my public key public. So everybody knows my public key, and I know all your public key. Actually, as part of your assignment, the first homework, you will have to send me your public key, okay? so that I know your public key. You keep your secret key as secret as possible. If somebody compromises your secret key, your identity is gone. It's like, you know, it's the one of the most important thing that you have. Don't share it with anybody. Now, if I want to communicate, your name is? Shabnam. 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 Yes. Shabnam. If I want to communicate with you, I will go to your website and say, oh, this is Shabnam public key. I will encrypt this message with your public key. And now, nobody. Even if they know your public key, they cannot decrypt this message. The only way to decrypt this, message, uh, decrypt this message at this point is to use the secret key, and you are the only one who has it. Is that clear? <clears throat> so the disadvantage, of course, is no authentication, really, in this form of communication. Anybody can send uh, a message and say, this is you know, Shabnab. You know, this is from Giovanni, tomorrow class is canceled, don't show up. And she will open it, and it's confidential, but she will believe whatever is in it and not show up for class and get terrible grades and be in a lot of trouble. And also, the sender can deny having sent the message. Because say, oh, anybody can encrypt a message for Shabnap, you know, with her public key and pretend to be anybody. So there is, of course, now should be clear, a better way, oops, a better way to communicate, and it is that Alice now first encrypts the message with her secret key, okay, and then in addition encrypts it with Bob's public key and sends this message to Bob, okay? Now, when Bob receives it, first of all, to open the first layer of encryption, will use its own, his own private key. But now there is another encrypted message, and he will have to use Alice's public key, which is known, to decrypt the message. But the fact that the public key of Alice works in decrypting that internal message proves that the message were actu was actually encrypted with Alice's secret key. Which is great, because that now tells Bob that only Alice could have done that. Because only Alice owns the secret key. And you can see that in this new brave world, we have, as pros, we have confidentiality. Eve cannot break the encryption, cannot access the content. We have integrity. Still, you know, message tampering is a weak integrity. Uh, but message tampering uh, will be mangled by decryption, and now we have authentication because Alice is the only one who can encrypt with her secret key, okay? And in fact, encrypting with your secret key is a process that is called signing because you are the only one who can do it, and so encrypted with a secret key is equivalent to signing a document, okay, in the digital domain. You also have non-repudiation. Now Bob can go to a, a lawyer or a judge and say, look, this document is signed by Alice. She's the only one who could sign it. And look, if I try to decrypt with Alice's public key, which is public, it works. So that means that only the secret key of Alice could have been used to encrypt this message, which implies that Alice signed this message and is the actual sender or signer, okay? Great. So this is all great, but unfortunately, as somebody was noticing, this approach is vulnerable to man-in-the-middle attacks. Why? Because before, with the KDC, uh, the Key Distribution Center approach, or the symmetric approach, we had out-of-band establishment of secrets. So I could go in a room with Shabnab and say, okay, our password is cat. 23, and this is going to be our password. Nobody can hear that. Now, that would work and would prevent Eve. We assume that Eve cannot you know, 
um, observe that interaction. But now instead, I'm giving to everybody my public key, and so of course Eve can observe, intercept, and modify that communication. So what was super fun became not so fun because of man in the middle attack. So in a man in the middle attack, fundamentally, Eve acts as a proxy between Bob and Alice. So when Alice sends her public key to Bob, Eve intercepts it, stop, stops it, so prevents that message from reaching Bob, and takes her public key and sends it to Bob, say, oh, this is Alice's public key, trust me. But instead, it's Eve public key. When Bob does the same, Eve intercepts a message from Bob to Alice with Bob's public key, and you say, oh, Alice, oh yeah, this is Bob public key, but instead of giving Bob pu public key, is giving Eve's public key. Now, but Alice and Bob think that they have each other's public key, but they both have Eve's public key. So you can see where this is going. At this point, when Alice wants to send something to Bob, First, she will sign with her secret key, fine, we don't care about that, but for confidentiality, she will encrypt this with Bob's public key. But Alice doesn't really have Bob's public key. Alice actually has Eve's public key, and that's the key that she will use for encryption. So when the message, the encrypted message is sent, Alice is convinced that they achieved confidentiality and all those great you know, properties of communication, but the moment it, the, the message reaches Eve, Eve has her own secret key, so can open that message, see what's inside, because she, of, of course, also knows Alice's public key, because it's public. And at this point, it can take the signed message from Alice and re-encrypt it, okay, with her own secret key and with the real key from Bob, so when it goes to Bob, it will check out because Bob will verify the signature with what she thinks is Alice's public key, which is actually Eve's public key, but the message has been re-signed with Eve's secret key, and everybody is super happy with their communication channel, but actually each message is now accessible by Eve, okay? So this is not good. This is, for example, is the reason why when you, for example, uh, secure shell into a host and you get something message say, wait, the public key of the host has changed. Something could be doing something nasty on the network. Does it did it happen to you before? This is exactly because of this. Because if you don't have a way to say, oh, this public key is associated with this host, somebody could say, oh yeah, this is the public key of, you know, host, uh, I don't know, foo.cizzle.ucsb.edu, you're logging into the right host, come over, give me your password, we're gonna be friends. And you have no way to know if you're talking to the right host or not. And therefore, when, we, when they see a, a change in key, everybody's like, wait a minute, something nasty might be happening, this is not consistent with the information we have, we need to talk about it. Maybe you just reinstall the operating system, and therefore you generate a new set of keys, and you generate this alert, but this is the type of problems that you might incur in. To solve this problem, people introduced the concept of public key certificates. The basic idea of public key certificates is that we want to bind an identity with a key, so that Eve cannot make that little you know, switcheroo game of public keys pretending to be Bob with Alice and Alice with Bob. So, what happens, there is a certification authority that is out there that takes care of signing sets of information. The information is fundamentally, imagine your identity, your name, your you know, unique identifier, whatever that is, and your public key. Those two pieces of information are put in a message, and then they are signed with the secret key of the certification authority. That is called a certificate, okay? And you, instead of distributing your public key, you distribute your actual certificate. You say, look, the certification authority has said that Giovanni has this public key, and you tell it to the world. 
Now, how do people verify that? Well, the certification authority, in some cases, has a self-signed certificate where they take their own public key and they signed it with their own secret key, saying this is the public key of the certification authority that you should use to verify certificates. Okay, and so you can see that what happens, um, you make all these certificates available in various databases. So the people certificates you spread, you put on your websites, whatever. The certification authority self size certificate is very critical because if Eve intercepts how you download the self signed certificate, we're back in the man in the middle pro problem. Because, of course, you know, you could have all sorts of attack if that self signed certificate is compromised. So, what do you do? The self signed certificate of a certification authority is usually distributed in a redundant way and in your browser. When you download Chrome, Explorer, Firefox, it comes already with a bunch of self-signed certificates so that actually it's extremely hard for Eve to interfere with that process and put into your browser the wrong certificate. So a certificate here, you know, a pretty picture, it's something that has a lot of information, can add validity, uh, the certification authority, of course, that generated the particular signature algorithms uh, that have been used for various part. And most important, there is the subject and the public key and the signature of the certification authority. And this is, uh, in practice, what happens. So when Alice wants to communicate with Bob, First of all, Alice already has the public key of the certification authority. This is in her browser. She doesn't have, I mean, at a certain point in some super secure way, downloaded that certificate. And of course, Alice has the secret key of Alice. Then, okay, before the communication, Alice went to a directory and uploaded her public key certificate, and so did Bob. You see that this is not the CA, this is a directory. The cool thing of this scheme is that, different from the key distribution center situation, we don't need to have the certification authority online all the time. The certification authority does its certifying duty once to generate your thing, and then can go to sleep forever. It doesn't have to be online providing you know, information to, your, um, to you in order to communicate. This is, of course, only partially true because we have revocation, for example. If something goes bad, we have to be able to say that our certificate is not valid anymore. But let's take this out of the picture for a second. So the certificate of Bob and Alice are in a directory. And so now Alice wants to talk to Bob and just say, OK, I download the public key certificate of Bob. But how do I know that this public key is actually Bob's? Well, there is a signature from the certification authority. So this is a self-signed self -signed certificate. So I can verify that it's self-signed. I can extract the public key of the certification authority and verify the signature of this certificate. So I know that this certification authority decided that this public key belongs to Bob. Now, I can, with confidence, know that this public key is not Eve's public key. I'm not the victim, the victim of a man-in-the-middle attack. And I can use this public key to encrypt the message for Bob, of course, after having signed it with Alice's secret key for authentication. And of course, Bob does exact, exactly the dual. Yes? So you want to find out how to get this if it doesn't come pre-installed in your browser? There are directories. You know, there are well-known repository of certificates. Or you could go to Bob websites. You know, Bob has a website with his public key certificate, but it's signed by the certification authority. So Eve cannot put there something you know, that is Bob's certificate. 
Of course, you put a lot of trust in the certification authority. Because if somebody breaks into the certification authority and random, and which, which happened, of course, and random certificates are generated, then you can personate pretty much whoever you want. Okay? But a lot of the communi secure communication on the internet works along the scheme. And you can also have a hierarchical situation where you don't have one certification authority because people sometimes are not you know, wanting to have a global world order certification authority. They want to have you know, something more distributed. So you can have a certification authority that is responsible for signing certain, certain, um, uh, certain, certain users only. And of course, at a certain point, you would have one person si uh, certified by a certification authority might want to communicate with another person uh, that has been certified by a different certification authority. So there are two possibilities. Either you have a hierarchical structure where you have certification authorities certifying certification authorities. So you go up until you have a common root of the tree. And then suddenly you can see that when Alice gets Bob certificate, which is signed by this certification authority, say, OK, how do I know that this is really Bob and not Eve? Well, you get this certificate, this certificate, and that certificate. You trust that because it's also the one that certified you eventually. And you can see, OK, I verify the signature of this association, the signature of this association, the signature of this association. I know now there is a sort of a chain of trust that tells me that this is actually a trusted institution of some sort that is not going around giving you know, certificates left and right, but they actually they do the right checks and make sure that Bob is associated with its own, his own uh, public key, and therefore you will enable communication. You can also cut you know, the whole process by having cross-certification between certification authorities to speed up the process. So in conclusion, crypto provides a building blocks to do secure communications. We have different types of algorithms, symmetric, public key, hash function, random number generation. And we have a different composition of building blocks to achieve different aspects of security in communication. This is fundamentally what I absolutely want you to understand of crypto. You should be able to understand this well. Now we will see some sort of uh, applications or problems with crypto after the break uh, to conclude our introduction to crypto. So let's take a 10 minutes break and come back. Let's talk about what can go wrong in addition to man in the middle attacks. Let's talk about weak crypto. So as I told you, uh, the, our use of crypto algorithms is sort of like a process. We never, you know, apart from the one-time pad that has been proven to work, but of course is very cumbersome. But, uh, one thing that I never mentioned, I mean, the one-time pad has a key that is the size of the message itself. So if I want to send, for example, uh, a few megabyte of data to somebody, I have to generate a few megabyte of key material, okay, not 256 bit, but a few megabyte of key material, and in some out of band fashion, give it to that person. So at that point, why don't I give out of band just the data? Because at that point, it's as secure. So uh, the only way in which people would use one time pad in a secure way, they would just pre generate a lot of key material. They will meet in a dark alley. They will exchange you know, floppy disks with terabytes of key material, and they would go home, and whenever they need it, they would say, okay, let's use that key. Not the way you want to run the internet, okay? Maybe spy games, but not the internet. Okay, this said, uh, there are problems. For example, MD5 is not collision resistant. As we found, it was considered a great hash function for a while, but then you have a whole community of cryptographers, like in, in our department, we have Rachel, we have Stefano, and these people just look at this algorithm, it's like, hmm, wait a minute. Ah, I'm not convinced that that particular use of this, you know, scrambling or this 
mapping of one symbol to another would actually resist this type of attack. And then they found a problem, and now, bam, they have a collision. They can prove that there is a problem. So why is this a problem, for example, in the case of weak hash function? Because you can see that Alice can create, in this case, Alice for once is the bad guy, can create two contracts, OK? One that is favorable to Bob and one that is favorable to herself, OK? Now, she created these two contracts. In one, in one, say, oh, um, you know, there is this you know, transfer of stock options, you know, and one is a price and the other is another price. And then Alice creates variants of these two contracts until they hash the same value, OK? And what happens is that oftentimes, when you sign something, you don't sign the actual document. You generate a hash of the document, and you sign the hash. So if I can find two documents that end up in the same hash, I can, have, I can present to Bob this very nice, oh, I'm going to sell all this stock for you know, this little money, and have him sign it, OK? But then present the other document to a third party show, oh, no, look, Bob signed this. You should sell me this for this much larger price, OK? Of course, you know, Bob, if Bob hears about this transaction, will be, wait a minute, I know, I didn't sign that. But you can actually, if suppose that Bob is out of the way, you killed him or something like that, <laughs> and now you can go and just say, hey, you know, this is a valid signature. Look, Bob signed this thing. So it's not very good to have collision in hashes. Also, uh, you have problem in predictable uh, pseudo-randomness. So if you um, use a particular um, good random function, then you can actually have good randomness. If you use a bad random function, you might end up having a bad random uh, series of numbers. And in particular, if you seed a pseudo-random generation algorithm with a predictable seed, then you can predict the whole sequence. Because while random number generation, real random number generation, are just, you just spit out randomness. You know, you, you, you can't control it. It's just there. The cool thing of pseudo-random pseudo number uh, generators uh, is that you can control this randomness. So you set a seed, for example, 55, and you know that if you start from 55, the sequence of numbers that you will generate will always be the same. They look random, but they'll always be the same, which is great. For example, if you're testing something and you want a predictable, repeatable, yet random-looking series of numbers, which happens all the time, okay, it's very nice to have these numbers. But then you have to consider that if I can guess the seed that you use, your randomness is gone. Because now it's predictable. If I know the seed, I can predict the numbers that you will generate. And this is a constant problem in security. This is why one of the major errors that people use in, um, in this case is the seeding. Because the pseudo number generator usually are, you, you take them at, from a library. You don't come out with your own unless you are courageous or incompetent, depending from the point of view. But if you use a good pseudo number generator, then it all, it's all about the seed. And we will see an example that is actually uh, very interesting. And the seed is actually uh, based on, you know, decides in a way uh, how predictable your sequence is. And in general, there is a, a, a way to uh, measure the predictability of something, and it's through, through entropy. So something that is a high entropy means it's not predictable. Something that is low entropy is very regular and is therefore predictable, is less random. Okay? And so it's really important to understand how much of this entropy you're actually producing. And of course, there is also something called snake oil crypto. Uh, Bruce Snayer has a, a nice description of what it is. And usually there are people that, you know, you, you can find it sometimes on the internet, and there are people who say, oh, forget about AES. I have a much better algorithm. It's called 
foo foo 32 and we only two bit of encryption as equivalent to the one time pad it's unbreakable and you would you know most people will say are you crazy this makes no sense but there are several signs that you know people as you know you can find in certain description the pseudo mathematical uh, stuff new math completely say oh this crypto system is based on a completely new mathematical system and but I'm not going to tell you what it is because of course it's secret uh, propri proprietary cryptography it's secret trust me uh, extreme cluelessness is another sign that this crypto is not very good um, ridiculous key lengths people say oh this is strong because as a trillion bit encryption uh, key and it happens uh, of course there's always like one time pad whenever people say is as strong as the one time pad you know they're they're saying something that is uh, of course inane uh, various claim and security proofs that usually mean absolutely nothing but most important cracking contests you will see in these websites are like we put a Porsche for uh, as a cracking target anybody who could break our crypto would get this Porsche and nobody got this Porsche then it's like we put a Ferrari and uh, I'm serious and you know and we wait for six months and nobody broke our crypto the Ferrari is still there we put this other million dollar prize and nobody broke it and and it goes on and on and on and these are signs that of course they're trying to validate their crypto in other ways than what's commonly done which is to undergo a peer review process and you might be familiar with the crypto conference for example is every year here in August in Santa Barbara is uh, and that's where all the cryptographers get together and bang on each other's algorithms or crypto protocols and that find flaws or weaknesses and that's the way the field progresses usually is not by having a website that claims that they have a trillion uh, key type of algorithm so you can have bad crypto but you can also have bad crypto implementation for example um, uh, this is a lovely Dilbert cartoon that uh, says you know over here we have a random number generation 999999 say are you sure that's random yeah with randomness you're never sure could be right uh, and this is what happens uh, in a way um, in uh, well, in the OpenSSL implementation of Debian in 2008, there was um, a code snippet that was generating some errors, so they removed that snippet, and by doing that, they reduced sensibly the source of entropy for the, seed, the, the number generator, and they made it predictable, and that caused you know, a whole set of problems. And of course, you know, eventually they fixed it. There is a more uh, interesting and uh, I think fun description that was done in 2010 there was uh, a black hat talk uh, it's called how I met your girlfriend and <clears throat> it is uh, by a guy Sami Kamkar that looked at how PHP sessions were established so the basic idea of a PHP session is that when we start interacting I will generate a very random token and will send it to you and this token is sent back and forth in every single interaction and that identify the session if anybody else can show up with that exact token I would say okay you're that guy please come in okay so guessing this session token is fundamentally it's fundamental to break the security of course you can't guess it why because look what they do they take they write in a buffer the IP address of the remote host you're coming from the epoch who doesn't know what the epoch is is the number of seconds since January 1st 1970 it's a standard way to say this is how many seconds were from January 1st 1970 it's just a big number of seconds in the millions right and then there is the microseconds of the timer another 32 bits these are two 32 bits value then there is a, a random value 64 bits generated by this function and all this in total is 160 bits of entropy okay so this is 
160 bits of random bits that the attacker doesn't know, okay, to be able to guess how the, the, the identifier. Because all this information is written in this string. You re recognize this printf. And then SHA-1 is applied to it. So they build this big string. They put in a one-way hash function, SHA-1, and they generate this 160-bit hash function that is your session ID. Okay, And so everybody said, wow, that's a lot of entropy. In order to guess this, you have to brute force 160 bits. That means that you have to try 2 to the 160 attempts. That's a lot of attempts. So imagine you, know, you try all these possible 200 exhaustive search of this would be completely unfeasible. It would take you forever. Never, never possible. Well, these guys say, let's look at this a little closer. Well, let's do, first of all, the IP address, IP address is 32 bits of entropy. Fine. The microseconds are actually not 32 bits of entropy. Because a microsecond is only a value from 0 to you know, a million, or a million minus 1. Okay? This is represented with 20 bits. That means that the top 12 bits are always 0. Because you're not using the whole 32 bits. Because you're representing with 32 bits a value that can only take a million value instead of you know, 4 billion. And therefore, a lot of the bits are always the same. Sadly, they're not entropy anymore. Okay? So we already have less bits than we know. Then we have the random value. But for example, the epoch, the seconds from where you connect, uh, can be actually guessed by looking when somebody came in. And it was showing that on the log, on some kind of website, you can say, oh, look, you connected to this website, and this is the date. This date is precise to the second. So at least you can guess within those seconds a few value. Say 100 value, 200 value, that's nothing. Okay? So suddenly, your epoch is gone. It's zero bits of entropy. Because I know when you started talking to the thing. And you can see how these 160 bits are getting smaller and smaller. And for now, it's 116 bits. Still pretty big. Okay? Of course, he said, wait a second. The IP address can be identified if I send you on this PHP session, I'm able to convince you to click on a link to a site under my control. Suddenly, I see you coming in. I know your IP address. Boom. 32 bits of entropy are gone. OK. We just went down to 84 bits of entropy. Can we do something more? Well, that's where things are even uh, more interesting. If you look at this, you know, the seeding of the random generator that generates 64 bits okay, is actually a combination of the time and the process ID of the process. So you can see that there are two aspects. One is the second is XOR, uh, sorry, uh, XOR with the negated microseconds. And then there is the process ID of the process. And these are combined. But look, so first of all, only the lower 20 bits matter. Because if you look, the random value is only 20 bits because it's between from 0 and a million. Okay. So when I XOR these two, I know that the upper part of the microseconds is always the same. It's all ones because it will be all zero, but it's negated, so it's all ones. Great. The epoch, OK, doesn't change that much. Because it's true that it's a big number, but if you look how much time there is before you know, the upper part changes, it takes around 12 days. So the seconds are not changing that fast. OK? So if you look at the epoch, this is the number of seconds since January 1st, 1970. So as this changes, okay, this part 
changes one, two, three, once a second, okay? But this top part never changes, and the part that we're worried about, the lower 20 bits, you know, this, the upper part stays a, the same for 12 days. So we know this part. In a window of 12 days, this is completely static. If you combine with this, that never changes because we never go above a million, bam, that part is not random anymore. We know it. Less entropy. Less entropy. Okay? Also, the process ID is only up to 32,768 you know, on Linux. And so only 15 bits of the 32 bits matter. Okay, less entropy. So the actual seed is only 35 bits. And if we can execute PHP code on the remote host, so this again becomes what is our threat model? Can we execute code because we broke into it or because we have a user account? We don't know. But if we can, we could actually extract the, the PID and go back to extra and, and goes down to 20 bits. And the whole entropy that is left is 40. So you can see that at this point, if the attacker can even execute the LCG value and extract one value of the sequence or several values, can actually pre-compute the possible seeding of the system and identify which random number was actually, which sequence of random numbers were actually generated. And at that point, the entropy left would be only 20 bits. And at this point, with 20 bits, it's a million cookies. That means a million attempts of you know, various sessions ID. That's totally feasible. I mean, you get you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of connection to a busy website per second. Okay? So creating a million cookies is not that big of a deal. Suddenly, something that'd be completely unbreakable 160 bits of entropy is reduced to something completely brute forceable. So this shows that even though the encryption at different steps was not broken per se, the seeding or the use of random source of randomness was completely botched. And therefore, as a result, this was a, a possible attack. So these are a caveat. One thing that I want to talk about is what do we do nowadays for secure messaging? And this is partly because I want you to be able to do this. It's part uh, of what you have to do for your first assignment. It is use PGP. So uh, PGP was an application for secure messaging that was developed by Philip Zimmerman a long time ago. And it became very popular. And as since then being sort of standardized, and now there is an uh, open PGP standard that describes you know, how you do encryption, which function you can use, how you compose it, the format of the message. It's not very interesting. But the interesting part is there is an open source application called NuPG that is available to you. It's, of course, free. It's open source. And is very useful to create any kind of you know, secure communication. So it's an implementation of all those building blocks and communication primitives that we just saw uh, before. So you can do digital signatures, you can do encryption, you can do compression, you know, base64 encoding if you don't want to have binary stuff and you want to have an ASCII representation of a message. So the basic concept is very familiar to you at this point. Each user has, you know, one or more private key and corresponding public keys, okay? Um, optionally, your private key or private keys, if you have multiple, can be encrypted. Why? Because if somebody breaks into your home directory, will not be able to steal your secret key ring and impersonate you. They will have at least to put a key logger and find out what your password is when you're decrypting or something similar. So it's a, an additional level of security. And you can generate any time a key pair doing GPG dash dash gen key and will generate your key. And at any time, you can use the dash dash armor to generate 
a printable version of any key or any message. For example, if you want to generate a, a public key version that you can put in your web page that is just ASCII, this would be the command. You just export the key. By default, you export your public key. And you have, of course, do an extra effort to export your secret key because that's very dangerous. But this will, be, will, will create something that you can put on your web page or um, something like that. And the keys are self-signed. So there is no concept of a certification authority, and we will get to it. So I expect you to be familiar with GPG. This is something that will help you for the rest of your life. Now you know how to do symmetric encryption, public key encryption, signing, signing for others. You need to know, as, not as security expert, but as computer scientists, you need to know how to use GPG. This is how a uh, uh, GPG key looks like. You can see that all this, uh, these numbers is what we call a base64 encoding. And fundamentally is a way to represent binary data using only printable characters. So uh, this is very important. Base64 is not encryption. Base64 is encoding. So using something, encrypt, uh, encoding something with Base64 doesn't mean that it's protected against, there is no key, there is no secure algorithm. It's just a way to represent data so it can be sent in an email and it's not just a bunch of binary. So uh, OpenPGP works this way to uh, send messages. So whenever you want to send a message to a bunch of destinations, a bunch of people, what uh, GPG does, it creates a symmetric uh, key for encryption and encrypts the message with that key. The symmetric key is then encrypted with the public key of each recipient. Okay? And in addition, the um, hash of the message could be generated, and that hash is signed with the key of the, uh, of the sender, with the secret key of the sender. So I wish I had a, uh, one of those fantastic, yeah. You guys have one? Oh, fine. Oh, savior. So uh, if you can imagine, you know, fundamentally, when you send a message, you take the key, you generate a key K randomly, OK, anything. You take the message, you encrypt it with that. And then you take, you send together with the message, the key with the public key of the first person, the key with the public key of the second person. And so only the people that have the secret key associated with this can extract the key and decrypt the message. Is that clear? Of course, if you want to add, if you want to add uh, a signature here, you would do a hash of the message, you know, and encrypt it with the secret key of the sender. And you can do the two things separately. In fact, you know, as you can see here, if you have a sign a message, you just create a hash code. And then the sender generates a signature from the hash by encrypting the hash code with the private key. At this point, the thing is, of course, attached to the message. And the recipient decrypts the message using the public key and uses the hash to verify that the signature is actually the one corresponding to the original message. So if I receive something that say, oh, this is the hash of the message message, and this is signing with some secret key of the sender, I can first verify this and extract it. And then what I would do, I would take this message, apply the hash of this message, and make sure that is the same of the one that was signed. That's how you verify that a signature has been applied correctly. You have to do your own hashing. You cannot just verify the signature because I could put you know any message here and say oh you know please buy all the stocks of this Enron company who's doing great and then I put the signature on the hash of a completely different message unless you check that the hash of this message is actually the same that is including the signature the signature is moot okay 
So this process is very important. Is that all clear? Awesomeness. <clears throat> so this is uh, how a sign message looks like. You can see that GPG has an option. You can say clear sign. That means that instead of having you know, uh, this encrypted or encoded in a way that is not visible, since this is just sign, there is no confidentiality. This is a perfect in the clear, all your bases are belong to us web uh, message. And the only thing that matters is that it's signed. So you can verify that this message has been sent by a certain person. So this provides only authentication and non-repudiation, but no confidentiality. Okay? There is nothing hidden here. It's just a way to use public crypto to provide that. An interesting thing with uh, OpenPGP is the concept of key management. So you generate a key and you generate a self-signing certificate. So fundamentally, you are your own certification authority. This decision, this design decision for the system comes from the fact that the originator, the Philip Zimmerman and the group that started this uh, approach were against this idea of a certification authority which would decide you know, who is associated with whom and they wanted a more peer-to-peer -peer interaction among the people involved in the system. So they decided that they would sort of introduce um, a kind of a reputation-based system where you have other people signing your key. So everybody fundamentally is a certification authority and you decide you know, who you trust in this web of trust that, they, that is defined by who signs whom. So for example, I can decide that Sasha is an awesome certificator. I know he's very thorough. He would never, ever, ever allow somebody like, you know, Tegan pretend to have Shane public key. So if Tegan goes to Sasha, I'm confident that Sasha says, hey Tegan, is this really your public key? Let me check, generate it in front of me. I want to make sure. And so there are these key signing parties you know, where parties are really, people get together, they sign each other's sign, uh, each other keys, and this way they establish trust. Because if I trust Sasha, that he's gonna be a good signer, when I see a public key for Shane, that say Shane has this public key, I say, oh, wait, I know Sasha, I trust him, he's a good guy, he doesn't make mistakes. And then I find also it's signed by, some, by Lucas that I also trust, and suddenly it's like, okay, oh, no, I know Lucas, I know Sasha, these are good guys, you know, I can trust this. Of course, managing this web of trust is not very linear. If you think about a public key certificate and certification authority, they have a clear structure that can be hierarchical, you know, or they can be, you know, a single uh, certification authority. Once you have a web of trust, there is a lot of things that you have to take care of in terms of establishing what are your levels of trust. What if the, you, you find somebody that Shane trusts as an introducer, but I don't know. Now, what is my level of trust for that person? Do I can trust Shane as a signer, but how do I know how good he is at trusting somebody else? I can decide that this, oh, he's awesome at trusting somebody else, and since he trusts Tegan, I also trust Tegan, or ah, I'm not really sure about that. And so creating all these different models can be challenging. And understanding exactly the level of trust that you have in this situation is not always straightforward. Another problem in, uh, in general in public key system is what happens when a secret key gets compromised. So suddenly, you have to say to the world, stop using the, 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 the corresponding public key. Forget it, you know, now my secret key has been compromised and, you know, absolutely you have to create a revocation message that is sent to the world in some, you know, good way. You can send it to everybody you ever talk to. You can put it on your website. There are even services of, you know, that project, you know, that collect these uh, revocation messages so that the basic idea is that periodically you would go to these directories and say, okay, give me all the certificates or all the keys that have been revoked and I shouldn't use. And you do this 
depending on your level of you know, your threat model, you can do this every second, you can do this every week, but the basic idea that determines your window of vulnerability to a compromised key. If I check that for compromised key every week, that means that somebody who compromised a secret key for a week can impersonate that person to me. Okay? And so it's your choice to decide depending on the criticality of what you do. Okay? And so uh, by doing this both in PKI, so in structure, uh, public key infrastructures, and in web of, webs of trust like the one of OpenPGP, these messages are um, um, used to revoke keys. Common operators, things that you have to be familiar with, and actually part of your first homework will be to generate keys, sign keys, having keys signed by some of your classmates so that they're all verified and, and other things that require some attention. But you have to be able to encrypt a message with a secret key, encrypt a message with a public key of a single recipient, multiple recipient, create a clear signed, clear text signed message, and also sign and encrypt a message for a single user. Once you do this, you at least have the basic tools to perform crypto for what you need. And this is my uh, closing um, argument. It's another XKCD uh, thing that um, express some regret or I mean some uh, animosity of Eve towards Alice.